and welcome everyone to Fantasy Foresight, the podcast. We're your hosts and co-founders of FantasyForesight.com, coming to you from the Rambo Fixture Company Studios. I'm Ben. And I'm Jay. You ready to get rolling, Jay? You know it. Let's do this. All right, let's go. Welcome in, everyone. It is Thursday, May 28th, and we've got an exciting episode for you tonight where we're going to unveil an all-new custom metric that we call Foresight Consistency. Yeah. We've got our guy, Steve, the Foresight Encyclopedia, back with us. And once again, for better or worse, Fantasy Foresight, the podcast is live. How you doing tonight, Jay? Ben, you know I'm good. And you know what? I am so excited about this episode. One, we're unveiling a new metric, which we love at Fantasy Foresight. We love our numbers. But two, you know, when we when we approach these podcasts and these episodes, we always want to have, you know, real reactions to the data that we're discussing. And tonight, I am entering this podcast completely blind. I every reaction to the data you provide us is going to be a hundred percent genuine, and I can't wait to dive in. Steve, how are you doing tonight, my friend? <laughs> uh, I'm doing awesome, thanks, Jay. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm almost right there with you. I came down about an hour ago and really like broke this open and started looking at it. Kind of jogged down a few notes, and um, you know I think this is going to be a real fun one. Um, it's gonna gonna be a good time, guys. Thanks for having me on, as always. Absolutely. So the the way this episode is going to work tonight, first is the whole concept of uh, the whole concept of foresight consistency is that we love the consistency metrics that are out there, what we're calling normal consistency. But as always, we're always trying to push the envelope at Fantasy Foresight. We wanted it to continuously improve, and that was taking the next step to uh, you know just make a a far more complex equation when it comes to consistency taking the normal consistency metric in account and then also looking at how that consistency progresses each week throughout the season and at the end of it all the ranks that we ended up with is really interesting so we're going to look at the top six in our foresight consistency metric as a countdown from six to one for every position For entertainment purposes, we're going to start with the tight ends, move on to the wide receivers, then the quarterbacks, and we're finishing up with the all-important running back position. So, without further ado, let's kick it off with the tight ends. Number six in foresight consistency in 2019 was none other than L.A. Rams' Tyler Higby. This man finished as tight end eight overall in fantasy points. He played 13 games. And his current ADP, according to FantasyFootballCalculator.com, in 12-team PPR settings is tight end 10. So track it. The price is tight end 10. He finished as tight end 8 overall in points in just 13 games. And he is top 6 in foresight consistency. What do you guys think about the first player on our list tonight? I got to say, I mean, I'm a little surprised. I knew he balled out in the 13 games he did play, but the fact that he only played 13 games and was still the sixth most consistent tight end over that span is pretty remarkable. And like you said, the value's there. The price is right. Yeah, I'm all in on Tyler Higby. That's nice. Yeah, guys, uh, it's funny. I keep thinking of Tyler Higby as like the curious case of Tyler Higby. <laughs> just, <laughs> just because, I mean... <laughs> This, this this guy was an absolute yeah an absolute afterthought for the for the LA Rams last season and then you know you you see LA go into this you know two tight end formation down the stretch last season and coupled with Jared Everett going out with an injury and then you look at Tyler Higby I mean my goodness he absolutely was like the overall best tight end the last four weeks of the fantasy football season so. Man, it's he's very, 
very intriguing to me. Like I said, a curious case of Tyler Higby. I, I don't know whether to get behind the hype or like run away from it or what to do when it comes to him. <laughs> I think you can pretty safely believe in that hype because, you know, we talked about it last week on the, the tight end ADP episode. ADP tight end 10 where he's going hey. is, you know, you're starting to get to that point in the draft where, uh, you know, the upside is just as good as some of the much earlier tight ends. And check this out. From weeks 12 to 16, his average finish was 5.8. Like Steve said, he, he was he just balled out at the end of the year. So keep an eye on that ADP. If it stays about where it's at, that could be one of the steals of the position in this upcoming draft this year. Moving on to number five in our countdown at the tight end position, we have New Orleans Saints tight end Jared Cook. And he finished overall as tight end seven in fantasy points last season. And his current ADP is just behind Tyler Higby at tight end nine. I mean, a, another rock solid value heading into 2020. Yeah, Steve, you want to take this one? Oh, you know, no, I do. Um, <laughs> if you guys listen, anyone who's listening to this podcast, uh, you, you know, I have a little. A uh, spot in my heart for Jared Cook, but uh, yeah, guys, he kind of kind of similar to Higby, um, not nearly to the extent, but I mean, Cook kind of you know really built a rapport with Drew Brees once they both were back from injury and um, fine tuned together and really built up a rapport, built some of his trust in the red zone, and and it showed. I mean, he had nine touchdowns last year, and he he just really played well down the stretch, and and I'm sure that has a, a lot to do with where he lands in our foresight consistency metric. Yeah, you know, I didn't have a ton of his shares last year, so I, you know, I kind of monitored him a little bit from afar. I wasn't up close and personal, and just my impression last year was that obviously he was good, but I thought he was much more volatile in fantasy scoring than being the fifth most consistent tight end in the game. So to me, that's a little surprising, and you know, I got to give a little more credence to one Mr. Cook. Definitely, especially if that ADP price tag stays where it's at. And just to give everybody a little bit of a preview, you know, over the next four weeks, we're going to really dive into one position group at a time and talk about what we learn with all the fantasy relevant players of that given position. And we're going to compare things like overall fantasy points, average points per game, normal consistency, foresight consistency. We'll cover the, uh, the number of weeks they had elite upside weeks. The, the number of weeks that they were, you know, an RB1, a wide receiver one, or a wide receiver two, RB2, what have you. This week, we really just want to dial in and hone in our focus on foresight consistency because it's an all new metric at Fantasy Foresight. Love it. And it will be added into the total foresight equation going forward. So uh, we're really excited about it. And moving on in this countdown, our foresight consistency tight end four last season, Jay was your guy. Philadelphia Eagles tight end Zach Ertz. All right. He he finished as now here's the very first time in this podcast where we see this concept that we're going to dive into a little bit more next week. This guy Zach Ertz finished as tight end 2 overall in points but was only tight end 4 in foresight consistency. So, okay. you know, you you tend to see your average player really focus in on just the overall fantasy finish when they're looking at ranks heading into the next season. And you have to take it so much farther than that. So it just tells me that, you know, Zach Ertz's usability from a week to week basis was just lagging a little bit behind his overall finish. But I will say his current ADP is right in line with his foresight consistency finish currently sitting at tight end four. Yeah, I mean, I like that price. I think that's probably a little bit more appropriate for him going into the season just for the points you made, Ben. And, you know, I, I had some shares of Ertz last season. There were some weeks where obviously it was great. There were some weeks that it wasn't. Um, but hearing that he was tight end four in consistency, even is a slightly surprising. I mean, obviously he's one of the elite tight ends in the game. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know if he's starting that slide that we've all been expecting, but, uh, I, I mean, the price is appropriate. What can I say? Yeah, uh, not a whole lot to disagree <laughs> with as far as that's concerned. However, you know, when you do look at some of his week-by-week -week performances, I mean, he, he really was 
a little a little bit boomer bust in that Eagles offense, which is a, is a it's a little concerning, guys, when you consider the fact that that was a mash unit last year. I mean, they had yeah. running backs playing wide receiver. They were doing anything they could have pass catchers. So I was a little bit surprised when I first broke this open and looked at it to see that Ertz had, like, you know, not as of, uh, sorry, not as of a consistent season last year as far as his week-to-week finishes were concerned. Yeah, you're right, Steve. There were uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times last season that he finished tight end 12 or worse. Uh, so, you know, like the, to Steve's point, there were also plenty of times where it was a top three tight end. Yeah. So three, one, three, one, one, five. So it is really, he is really demonstrating that at last season when there was a very limited amount of weapons, he was still very boomer bust. And everybody's talking about Mr. Godard over there. And, uh, you know, he's just going to become more and more involved in that offense as time goes on. So that's going to spell a little bit of trouble for Ertz. But like I said, Right now, his I mean, is in line with that foresight consistency rank. So, uh, if Carson yeah. Wentz is healthy, that's still his best friend. I'm, you know, it's Zach Ertz is still the top receiver on that team. It's not. it's going to be interesting. I don't know. You know, they drafted a, a great rookie. They brought in Marquise Godwin, so or Marquise Goodwin. So <laughs> that is sarcasm from a. I uh, you know I, you know I don't know I they're gonna have to spread those targets out to all that talent. <laughs> Spike in this yeah, drink tonight. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be it'll be interesting, guys. Hey, for all for all we know though, as we get closer to the draft, for all we know, Ertz might turn into a little bit of a value. It'll be interesting yeah. to see where his ADP ends up. For I sure. certainly hope you're right, Steve O. And the next guy on our list coming in at foresight consistency tight end three last season was then Oakland Raiders tight end, now Las Vegas Raiders tight end, Darren Waller. And he was somebody that we touched on a little bit last week. Seemed like Jay and I might have disagreed on him a little bit. Um, and, you know, the numbers the numbers kind of support Jay, actually, because he was tight end five overall in fantasy points, but tight end three in foresight consistency. Now, his, his ADP price tag is, is somewhat of a value at tight end five. But when you dig in a little bit more, Mr. Trophy, Weeks 1 through 8, his average finish was 4.7, but weeks 9 through 16, his average finish was 13.25. So as other weapons started to reveal themselves throughout that season, his performance waned, and the last time I checked, they drafted all the wide receivers. So, <laughs> yeah. so I have to share the trophy in the Waller Ben J argument battle? Is that how that works? We're, we're going to split the trophy for now? All right, fine. Oh, okay. I mean, if you want to start going back and keeping score, I'm pretty sure that trophy would be over here. Uh, You know what? Like you said, Darren Waller was the early season darling at the tight end position in fantasy football. He was the hot commodity, probably went largely undrafted in a lot of leagues and was really the huge key pickup for a lot of guys and became a huge asset, huge trade asset. Um, But yeah, you know, kind of quieted down down the stretch. Uh, So... Hopefully, if you're out there, you you rode the wave early and were able to capitalize on his value. But, uh, yeah, I mean, no surprise that he was a top three in both scoring and consistency last season. And I'll just kind of straddle the fence, which I know (laughs) is boring. But um, (laughs) I don't, you know, I I certainly don't think his upside is going to be as high as it was last season. But I still think I, I could totally see him flirting in that top five finish. And a lot of that's just to do with... The, you know, Oakland, you're right, Ben, they did draft all the wide receivers, but the rookie wide receivers, there's that learning curve. Derek Carr loves to throw the ball, like, as short as humanly possible. <laughs> and and Darren, Darren Waller is his safety blanket. So, you know, we all know with COVID-19, the kind of shortened offseason. Who knows yeah, that's a good point, kind Steve. offseason we'll have. So, you know, the stunted learning curve, I just, you know, it'll be interesting. Like, and and it could result in a situation like last year where you see Darren Waller get fed targets early on and then kind of trail off as those rookies come along. So, and that could have him be a guy that goes from a top two, three tight end early and then finishing kind of in the middle of the road when it's all said and done. Ben, tell me. definitely an interesting guy. What's his ADP again right now? 
uh, he he is currently going as tight end five. And I was just going to, to your point, Jay, yeah. I was just going to add on that. It, it all comes back down to price. Tag. Right. right. Right now at tight end five, you know, based on what we covered last week, that's still probably a little bit too high draft equity for how shaky of my confidence is in him this season. But if that drops down another spot or two, all of a sudden I think that's I think that's massive value because I think it's certainly in his range of upside that a range of outcomes that he uh, has the same type of season that he did last year, finishing his tight end five overall. Uh, but I, I definitely think it's much more likely this season that he ends more towards that tight end ten. He's going to be a fun guy to cover during our preview episode to see where that ADP falls a little bit later on in the preseason. Absolutely. Next up on our list, we have got foresight consistency, tight end to, not surprising, Mr. George Kittle from the San Francisco 49ers. Guy was an absolute beast, and the numbers support that. He did miss a couple games due to injury, but he played 13 out of the 15 fantasy, you know, typical fantasy season football games when you factor a one by into a 16 week schedule. And he was tight end four in overall points. So once again, he was better in foresight consistency than he was in total points, which lends to uh, you believing that if he was able to play those extra two games, that he would have finished more towards that tight end too. And his current ADP is right in line with that at tight end two. Cannot argue with that. If you are going to go tight end, you probably are best served to go early. And he's certainly one of the guys worth spending that equity on. Another team that drafted wide receivers, they have a lot of young talent in that wide receiving core. George Kittle is the seasoned vet, the talented guy, and a fun guy, a guy with some personality that we can all get behind. And, you know, one heck of a season. Can I say, can it be slightly disappointing that he was tight end four overall? Is that, can I say that even though he missed a couple games? I mean, I, I think you absolutely can. Uh, you know, the tight end position is pretty weak once you get outside, you know, the, the, the elite few. And so it's not very hard to turn in tight end one overall numbers. So be, yeah, you I would mean, have expected a little bit more out of him than tight end four. Maybe tight end three or, def, or even tight end two. Uh, but, you know, those couple of games made the difference. I know he's tight end two in consistency, tight end four overall. So it's tough to, to be upset about that type of return. But, you know, I, I was looking for George Kittle to kind of take over the mantle as the number one tight end, at least fantasy tight end in the game last season. So to fall a little short of that, again, we're splitting hairs here, nitpicking a little bit. Yeah, and to your guys' this point, you know, he's definitely, you know, there, there's some nobody we're going to talk about next, but um, George, <laughs> Kittle's, George, George Kittle's Who definitely could be left? the uh, one, one B after this guy. Right. But the, the main thing, I think, to your point, Jay, about him taking over that, that number one tight end mantle is – you know, I just think uh, Jimmy Garoppolo in his lack of touchdown pass upside, how little that it's team It's as simple as Jimmy ball. Garoppolo. Yeah, it's as <laughs> yeah. simple as Jimmy Garoppolo. Exactly. We can, yeah, you're right, Benny. We can just, we can just move right on. <laughs> <laughs> Who's number one? I wasn't trying to hurry you. I was just trying yeah. to, to add to your point that, I mean, it is as simple as Jimmy G versus Pat Mahomes. I mean, if you're even close in talent level, you're getting a massive upgrade by being a part of Pat Mahomes' office. Do do we even yeah, need absolutely. to do we even need to cover number one? I mean, we can very briefly. I'm sorry, Travis Kelsey, that you're so good that you're boring. But yeah, number <laughs> one tight end in foresight consistency is none other than Travis Kelsey from the Kansas City Chiefs, who is being thrown the football by Pat Mahomes. He only had one out of 15 games played this season that he did not give you top 12 production, and that was because he was tight end 13 in week geez. one. That's it. That, how, how do you get more consistent than that? <laughs> you don't. Good I Lord. mean, he's, he's foresight consistency tight end one. He's overall tight end one. He's ADP tight end one. And you don't think twice about it. It's, 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 it's a fine value if the running backs and wide receivers that you want are not there. Yep. And then, guys, I, I, I just got to throw it in there because I said it about Jimmy G. On the flip side, you look at Kelsey's year last year, he certainly could be in line for some touchdown progression. And that's just, you know, not that he wasn't awesome as it is, but, hey, you know, you gladly take that and get maybe more of that 2018 out of this world, Travis Kelsey. So Absolutely. 
Well, we started off with the tight end position for a reason. Now, on to bigger and better things. Uh, moving on to the wide receivers, starting off with our number six wide receiver in our brand new foresight consistency metric is a very interesting guy heading into 2020. Tampa Bay fucking Bears. consistency metric. Wide receiver one is a very Chris interesting Godwin. guy heading I into mean, 2020. He, Tampa Bay he fucking Bears. consistency Bears. metric. Wide receiver one is a very Chris interesting Godwin. guy heading all last season. His current ADP is wide receiver six, right in line with his foresight consistency ranking. Now, a couple of things. The higher overall points finish compared to the lower foresight consistency finish would typically be a little bit of a red flag, but we have a major upgrade at quarterback, all right? I know Jameis Winston had all the volume because he had all the interceptions last year. Tom Brady's gonna be a lot more accurate, throw guys open, and not turn the ball over near as much. So, you know, I, that doesn't scare me with Chris Godwin whatsoever, and I would not be surprised if he finished wide receiver one overall in consistency and in overall points. I mean, it's tough to argue. There's a lot of expectations in Tampa Bay for those wide receivers this year because of the upgrade at quarterback, the upgrade in accuracy. You know, I think you and I may disagree a little bit just because it seems too good to be true sometimes. Like, it's just like you flip a switch and go. And I know Tom Brady is the GOAT. And, you know, I'm sure they'll get on the same page sooner than later. And it's not going to be like what we saw in Cleveland last year where you have all this talent and it doesn't really come to fruition. They have a good coach. They have, obviously, good leadership at the quarterback spot, and they have seasoned pros at wide receiver. So maybe it will come together, and all those guys will eat. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, look, Chris Godwin is obviously stepping up, and he's becoming the man. I don't know if he can unseat Mike Evans, but it's going to be fun to see which one comes out on top because they're both fantastic. It, it, yeah, guys, uh, I think, you know, you look at the last several years, how much Tom Brady has – absolutely relied on Julian Edelman out of the slot. And I just, I salivate thinking of Chris Godwin, who, you know, let's, let's be honest, is at this point in their careers, a younger, more talented, um, just a, a beast of a wide receiver in comparison to Julian Edelman. And you just think like how much that guy could eat if, you know, Tom Brady does rely on him and, and Hey, maybe, maybe a shortened off season will lend its hand towards that. I mean, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. You know, it's certainly going to be interesting. But, yeah, I'm, I'm more on your side with this one, Benny. Yeah, I mean, he only had four games, really, that hurt you last season. And he played 14 out of the 15 possible fantasy, typical fantasy games last year. So I just – I have a hard time believing that – so do we all agree that it is a massive upgrade for him from Jameis Winston to Tom Brady? I just if we do, I don't see how he's going to have any worse of a season than he had last year. Okay, let me let me let me pose this for you. Tampa Bay was playing from behind a lot and Jameis was slinging the rock all over the field. Is it possible that game flow wise they're in control of more games? They're establishing the run a little bit more and they don't have to throw the ball all over the field 50 times. Could that limit the upside a little bit, even that though balls be. are more accurate and they probably have a higher percentage, a higher catch rate on those targets? Does that, that balance it be. out? I don't know. It, it, it might, but another counterpoint to that is the fact that I, all the talk out of Tampa Bay is that Tom Brady is bringing an offense to town and everybody is adapting to him. And I think the closest sample size that we can look at is his Randy Moss season. That is the caliber of weapons that Tom Brady is having this season for the first time since then. And what did he do fantasy land that year? He lit it up. And, and now he's got an even more aggressive, more gung-ho type of quarterback in Bruce Arians who is not going to put him on a leash whatsoever. So, I mean, I just have zero concerns. I, I could see your point. I just, I'm, I just, my confidence is sky high on Chris Godwin and that whole Tampa Bay offense. Yeah, the the one big variable there, Ben, is he's got about a decade of extra miles on that on that body since the Randy Moss years. So I, you know, that's, that's that's not unfair. That's not unfair. It's but gonna be interesting to see. Anyway, some magic we, ageless, ageless juice. <laughs> TV twelve, baby. Uh, you know, we, I, we can get into more of that later too. Sorry, I digress. No worries whatsoever. Next up, we have got probably the most surprising name, in my opinion, on this list so far. 
You're looking at foresight consistency wide receiver five, ladies and gentlemen. You know who that is? Atlanta Falcons wide receiver, not Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley. What? Now, Calvin Ridley was a top five foresight consistency wide receiver in 13 of 15 games played last year. Wow. He finished in total points as wide receiver 22. His consistency tells you a whole different story, and his ADP is outstanding at wide receiver 17. Just like Chris Godwin, he only had four games that hurt you last season. Boy, that's an interesting one. So so can I extrapolate from that that he is just a super – he has a high floor but a low ceiling, just a super consistent scoring wide receiver too? I mean, you know – Is that essentially what he is? These numbers until, until next week, but a little bit of that. He only had one top six week, and he had three wide receiver one weeks out of those 13. Okay, so all right. So a little bit of that, but – you and I have talked about this offline a little bit. This is Matty Ice's second year with his offensive coordinator. Which makes a huge difference. What's that spell? That makes a big difference in the land of Matty Ice. So in my yep. opinion, that's an upgrade at Calvin Ridley's quarterback position. And that was with Julio not missing time last season. So they both can eat. And and I just Calvin's Calvin is much bigger of a surprise, I think, than most people think. And that ADP of wide receiver 17 is evident. And, and we always talk about it. Sorry, Steve, I don't mean to jump in again. But we always talk about what you need, where you are in drafts. And if you need a super safe you know, wide receiver two type guy, it sounds like there's nobody better available than Calvin Ridley. Safest floor in the league, possibly? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, to your guys' point. point about, you know, Julio Jones being there and, you know, how they can both eat. I mean, we've seen it enough now over Matt Ryan's career, the Atlanta Falcons offense. You know, they're going to air it out enough to where definitely two guys of the caliber that they are can both eat. And I think it benefits Calvin Ridley greatly, the kind of route runner he is. He's great at his craft to have Julio Jones opposite of him. And I think that's why you also see – Calvin Ridley lead that team in touchdown receptions his first two years in the league. And I think that's going to be a trend that continues. So, yeah, I, I can only see him being more and more of a consistent fantasy option the longer his career goes on and he has Matt Ryan throwing him the football, as long as Julio Jones is also there. I know a lot of people are like, oh, man, imagine how great he'd be without Julio. And I don't know. Not I, always I, the I case. Julio yeah. being there. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. It's definitely the most surprising name on this list and the biggest value on this list so far. Moving on, somebody that last season was dubbed as having a down year, uh, and that included a overall fantasy points finish of wide receiver three <laughs> and a foresight consistency finish of wide receiver four. Oh, let me hear who this garbage is. Yeah, we're yeah. Ask Bill O'Brien. We're talking about former <laughs> Houston Texans wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins. Do not sleep on his talent. He was just quoted today as saying how he thinks he's the best receiver in the league, and he cited all of his uh, his competition. He was like, "I love you, Mike Thomas. You're my guy." But you know what my numbers would be if Drew Brees was always throwing me the ball. <laughs> Julio Jones, I trained with you. I love you. You're my guy. But you know what my numbers would be if I was always getting the ball thrown to me by Matty Ice. And he's not wrong. Uh, no, and no. We saw we saw the marriage that was uh, Cliff Kingsbury and Kyler Murray last year in his rookie season. Now, did defenses figure that out? Are they, is Kyler going to be able to take a second-year step? And that's to be determined, but it's going to make his life a lot easier having DeAndre Hopkins around, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm, I, something tells me Michael Thomas probably had a few things to say back at him, just knowing Mike Thomas and how he handles stuff. But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I like you said, he's not wrong. I mean, look at the quarterbacks who he's had throw for him when Deshaun Watson hasn't been in the game, and, and the guy's been quarterback-proof. So, you know... Is it an upgrade going to Arizona from Houston quarterback-wise? No, maybe not. But, you know, the, again, the guy's been quarterback-proof, and they need to get the ball downfield. You, he's shown he can be a guy who can catch the ball 10 times a game and be the target. 
I mean, he, he's a Megatron type talent. He can be the only guy on the field. You know, he's going. You know where the ball's going. You can put three guys on him, and he's still going to get the ball. So, it just comes down to what that offense is going to look like this year. Is it going to take a step forward, like you said? You know, indications are yes, but you know, got to kind of wait and see. But he is an elite, an elite receiver, and for for his numbers to be that high and for him to have a disappointing season is just ridiculous. Yeah, there is a Cardinals offense. It's certainly going to be one that is going to be a lot of fun to kind of keep track of. Yep. Um, not only for fantasy purposes, just but the NFL. In right. The NFL. Yeah. And um, you know, I I I can certainly see where there's probably going to be a dip in you know Hopkins targets, but you know I also think that he could just be in a you know probably a better overall offense. You know, if they do take that next step to where. Maybe he gets in the end zone a little bit more, and um, yeah. the quality of those targets is a little bit better. So, yeah, definitely going to be one that's fun to watch, and you, you can't knock that guy whatsoever. I, I mean, awesome. the, he, he is motivated. He's going to leave it all out there for sure. Without so. a doubt, and he's in an offense that, quite frankly, just passes the ball more than the one he was in before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Deshaun Watson was middle of the road, 16th in pass attempts last season. Kyler Murray was ninth. Yeah. So... If you think that the efficiency and uh, the effectiveness of the targets is going to go up, I'm not so sure that the volume is going to go down that much. So, again, his ADP is currently wide receiver, too. So he's getting the respect that he is due. Sure. Uh, so it, it'll definitely be interesting to see any time a, a wide receiver of his caliber changes teams. But, you know, like Steve said, super, or Jay said, he's super motivated this year, and uh, it's, it's going to be a fun one to watch. Like some of the other guys we mentioned, he only had four games that hurt you last year, and uh, I just I don't see how he's really going to take another step back. So, anyways, moving on to our top three in foresight consistency at the wide receiver position. Uh, this gentleman only played 11 games due to injury last year. We did not penalize people for time missed due to injury. And so, coming in at number three, Green Bay Packers wide receiver Devontae Adams. He, because of those injuries, finished as wide receiver 26 in just 11 games. But, again, he was foresight consistency, wide receiver 3, and his ADP is a little bit out of value, currently at wide receiver 4. I'm sorry. i got to take a timeout. One of our league mates, our taco, our very own, <laughs> was jousting tonight. And he won! Our boy! Let's oh. give him a shout-out! Let's get a shout-out oh. to Uber! Our oh, very own... Guy, Uber is out there jousting <laughs> on real-life horses. Like, he is not faking. Like, this is the same guy who, who we've talked about in the past who might be uh, go-karting, uh, with, at, like Mario Kart style, in Tokyo or something. Yeah, I, thought, I was going to say, I thought, I thought he won the Mushroom Cup a couple of years ago. <laughs> and, now he won, and now he won jousting. Of course he did. Sorry. I, 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 I saw that come across. Yeah. That's our, that's our special guy right there. And Uber steals the show. Uh, yeah. As he should. As he should. Uh, DeAndre yeah. Hopkins. I'm sorry. De Devontae Adams is not happy with <laughs> yeah, fellas. Um, Devonte Adams. He, it, it's like, hey, if he's healthy and he's on the field. Who else does Aaron Rodgers have to throw the football to? I mean, it's, I, it's kind of as simple as that. Nobody yeah. apparently. Well, Green Bay yeah, wants. Green Bay wants it, to give him nothing else. <laughs> and they're they're very confident apparently in Devonte Adams. They're like, we will give him 230 targets equal to that of two wide receivers next season. So. But in all seriousness, if he, if he stays healthy and he's on the field, uh, I, I can't see any reason he doesn't probably end up leading the league in targets. And that will result in a monstrous fantasy season. It just has to. I mean, we, a wide receiver four price tag? I mean, talk about value, man. Yeah, it's crazy that you can be wide receiver four and be that much of a value, but he is. And, and that's another offense and another team that's going to be so interesting to watch from a fantasy perspective, but also a football perspective. All that drama that's going on behind the scenes and not necessarily behind the scenes some of it's playing out publicly and and you know to see Devonte there who a couple years ago we saw him get lit up and miss no time and be an iron man and then you know he picked up a couple of injuries and missed some time last season but normally he's a guy who you can count on to be out there week in and week out and take the shots so like you said steve if he's going to see that kind of volume and i really don't see where else it's going to go 
unless some of those other receivers start to step up. But, I mean, there's one target in Green Bay. You'd think Aaron Rodgers may be motivated as well to prove a point to, to the team before maybe he forces his way out. So, again, another situation to watch, but great value there. Yeah, five out of six of his finishes uh, at the end of the season after his injury consisted of wide receiver 13, wide receiver 13, wide receiver 5, wide receiver 10, and wide receiver 7. Wow. So it's clear as as time went on and the farther away he got from that injury, the more and more like himself he was playing. And while the Green Bay Packers may not have an actual active interest in seeing Devontae Adams get peppered with 200 targets, we have seen Aaron Rodgers openly defy coaching staff on the field before. Oh, yeah, we have. <laughs> what better way to defy that entire organization than do exactly what Steve said and give that man 200 plus targets? <laughs> and what better quarterback to want to send that message than Aaron Rodgers? I don't think any of us would be surprised. Amen. Yeah, that's right. I don't need to. I don't need any other wide receivers. They haven't done all Exactly. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, moving on to our foresight consistency wide receiver two. First set of teammates in this podcast. You thought we were talking about Julio Jones at number five. Yep. And even though we had a teammate at number five, he was still foresight consistency wide receiver two beast. And he, he didn't miss any time due to injury. I mean, he played, well, he did miss one game. Uh, he had 14 out of 16 games played. 415 and maybe just didn't bar the target. I will look into that. Either way, <laughs> he was very durable. He was extremely consistent. He finished as overall wide receiver four. His current ADP is a value for Julio Jones, currently going as wide receiver five. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, listen, Julio's got the permanent Q next to his name. I mean, he's always got a bad wheel. His ankles. Don't worry about it. What's that? That Q silent, don't worry about it. Oh, I, exactly. I, and, and what has he always done but turn in top five wide receivers overall in fantasy? So, you know, I, I, I've got zero concern about that, like you said. Second most consistent receiver last year, and I, 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 don't, I really don't see that seizing going into 2020, so... Yeah, I mean, for me, guys, I, I think the reason you see him going at WR5 is because kind of just how we're sort of talking about him. He's been doing this at such an elite level for so long. It's just it's kind of boring. And, <laughs> and um, you know, he with every year that passes, it's just kind of like, well, he's another year closer to the end, right? I mean, I, uh, I, I just uh, – that has to be some of the reasoning right. there, and, um, which which I can understand. But at the end of the day, you know, until until we see him slow down and stop having fourteen hundred yard seasons, you know, you uh, him uh, going at WR five just seems a little, you know, slightly criminal. Uh, yeah, well, we'll take it, especially me. <laughs> who who could be wide receiver one in consistency? Oh, I, I'm not sure. I'm sure nobody out there can guess that last season. The number one overall wide receiver was also the number one foresight consistency wide receiver. And that is none other than can't guard Mike New Orleans Saints wide receiver, Michael Thomas. He is affectionately known to us as MT. And man, I, what can you say? This, like I told you, every other guy in the top six of foresight consistency, even the ones that missed some time, all had four games on the nose that hurt you. Michael Thomas had one. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's 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 pretty incredible because we always talk about how tumultuous the wide receiver position can be. You can have a great game and still finish as wide receiver 13 because of all the guys that boom that week and hit home runs. And to see what he did over the course of an entire season, and we talked about other teams who maybe lack other weapons outside their primary target. Well, New Orleans did as well. I mean, Michael Thomas, We everybody knew where the ball was going. What other quality receivers did they have last year? So, you know, it's just incredible what he has done. He gets fed the ball at an incredible rate. So, I mean. Yeah, I mean, the kind of route runner he is. The, yes. The body frame that he has. I mean, it's, there's really, with, and with the NFL passing rules that we have, right, for um, defensive backs, it's, it really is nothing you could do about this guy. And it doesn't matter whether it's Drew Brees, Teddy Bridgewater, 
he's just coming for you week in and week out. And I'll tell you what, his production last season, I mean, it was that of like an elite running back in fantasy football. I mean, it, it was just insane. And 149 receptions. I mean, what, Marvin Harrison's record stood since like 2002. Um, an incredible season, and uh, certainly somebody that I'm sure anyone in fantasy football would love to lock up as their WR1. I'll, I'll tell you what, Steve, real quick. When Michael Thomas came out, that was his one huge thing, was that he was the best route runner in his draft class. And to me, that that lends towards having a more immediate impact in the pros and getting on the field and being trusted and, and may, being able to have an immediate impact. Um, unless you're some guy like Tyreek Hill and you have Olympic speed, you know, where teams are going to find a way to get you on the field. That's what I look for now when I see wide receiver prospects come out as far as who's going to have, who's going to transition the best, the soonest. And I look for those types of, of attributes, you know, ever. Hey, no doubt. (laughs) Similar touchdown numbers last season too. My (laughs) Thomas had nine. Calvin Ridley had what? 10. Yeah. So interesting. Anyways, that was our wide receivers and, uh, you know, fun episode so far. And I think we've got the two most fun position groups left. Oh, boy. Uh, This is the only remaining snoozer on this list. (laughs) (laughs) Foresight consistency QB six is no longer relevant because he's now a backup. That is none none other than former Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback Jameis Crablegs wins. Wow, uh, you know, but here's the thing: Tom Brady is going to be able to be that without all the interceptions. And you know, the the only reason that Jameis was on this list is because he just kept throwing the interceptions. I mean, maybe the LASIK surgery in the off season fixed it. Hey, so, we'll you know, see. Uh, if- that plus Sean Payton and tutelage from Drew Brees, maybe. Hopefully, Drew Brees doesn't get hurt. But if he does, the silver lining will be it'll be very interesting to see how Jameis performs in that off. Listen, man, if his vision really was as bad as they say it was before LASIK, it's no, like, I'm surprised he didn't throw more picks. Like, <laughs> he can't even see downfield. He couldn't read the scoreboard. Like, what are we doing? How, I how... find it fascinating that there's now, like, a, a 5,000-yard 30-30 club. Like, <laughs> right. And it's, it might last for a hundred years. I don't know. That's crazy. It's fascinating it's a to very, me. It's a very uh, paradoxical type of <laughs> stat line. You know, like you're not supposed to be able to be that productive when you were somebody capable of throwing 30 interceptions. No kidding. Which to me spells you're an insanely talented quarterback who just had either no discipline or no vision. And apparently it might have been the latter. So. A little bit of both, maybe. A little bit of both. <laughs> One day maybe we'll get a chance to find out. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Yep. Moving on to a guy who, despite having a dislocated knee in Week 7, was able to produce an average finish of QB10 returning just three weeks later. He is number five. He is number five on our foresight consistency list, but he is number one in your hearts. He is Super Bowl MVP, champion, future Hall of Famer, Kansas City Chiefs quarterback, Pat Mahomes. He was QB8 last year overall in fantasy points because of some of that missed time. He only played 12 of 15 fantasy eligible games in a 16 week season. But still, whenever he was on the field, he was even injured and hampered, was still the fifth most consistent guy out there. As you can imagine, his current ADP is QB1, and if you are going to roll the dice on a high-end quarterback, there's only two worth doing it, and he's one. You know, Ben, I'm I'm really disappointed in you. You you named all of his amazing accolades, and you left out probably the most important one, and that is that he is the keeper player for Team Disorderly <laughs> Conduct. Fair play. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, future Hall of Famer, what can I say? A little down year. You know, the three weeks last week, last year really hurt. I'm not going to lie to you. Those stung. I could have used, you know, some five touchdown games. But whatever, you know, it happens. We're moving on. We're focusing on 2020 now. Heck of a consistent player. Heck of a score. QB1 next season. Correct. Yeah, and there's not a whole lot I can even add to, add to that guy. I mean, he, he is what he is. He's phenomenal. He's in a phenomenal offense. He has phenomenal weapons. Phenomenal. We can move on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Yes, sir. All right. Next up, this one was surprising. All right. Uh, you know, I, I know that he had a solid year last season coming off the injury, but I did not think that New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees huh. played solidly enough to finish as foresight consistency QB4. He finished as QB24 in overall fantasy points per game because he missed wow. five games due to injury last year. He's currently going as ADP QB7. So in what could be his last year, in what could be his most uh, talented set of weapons in that time, don't forget they added Manny Sanders. Yeah, they did. Crazy talented Mike Thomas and uh, Kamara's healthy and Jared Cook is really good, like we said. That defense is nothing, nothing to mess with, and that coaching staff is second to very few, if any. So, uh, you know, right now, if Drew Brees is sitting there at QB7, and I really like the first six wide receivers and hopefully running backs is all you drafted to that point, man, that's going to be tempting, and I wouldn't blame you if you went that direction. You know, you're painting the picture, and I can just see in drafts where guys start to reach for either rookies, young players, or, or teams that have a lot of hype around them. And we talked about in our quarterback uh, consistency podcast about how you should sit back and and just wait a couple rounds. Let those guys come off the board. Let people make those mistakes and reach. And then you take a guy a little bit later who's going to turn in one of the most turn out to be one of the most consistent players at his position. And look, you know, the injuries hopefully that's an anomaly and he plays all 16 games this year and if he does, then you're looking at obviously a QB1 and one of the most consistent QB1s in fantasy. Yeah, I mean, guys, up until last season, Drew Brees, I don't believe he missed time since going back to when he had the shoulder injury with the Chargers. That, was, that seems like a lifetime ago. And yeah. so, you know, if he does bounce back and he plays a full season next year, I mean, you look at it, he went out early against San Francisco in week two. So he essentially, you could almost say he didn't play six games. And yet he still threw for 27 touchdowns. I'm sure whatever that extrapolates out to probably leads the entire NFL. So he is very interesting to me. Um, like you said, Ben, best weapons he had. They added Manny Sanders. And you just think, like, uh, at QP7, that's, you know, that's, like you said, very tempting, Ben, if you have your whole starting lineup. Oh, yeah. By then. It's not going to be sexy. A lot, you know, he's old. He's been around forever. It's kind of boring. But what can you say? Well, you made a great point about his durability, and if memory serves me correctly, it was a fluke injury where he was trying to follow through on a throw and he hurt his throwing hand. So, I mean, yeah. it's not like, you know, old rickety Drew Brees just can't handle it anymore. We've seen that happen to quarterbacks thousands of times. So, it was almost like it was about time he had something like that happen. Exactly. He had, he had and, then, you know, even, and that still couldn't keep him out. You know, like he still finds a way to come back and beat just normal old Drew Brees and almost get back to the Super Bowl. So, yeah, man, I can't wait for fantasy football season. Please start on time. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, all right, moving on. Here is another huge surprise. I got two back-to-back -back surprises for you guys. All right. Foresight consistency QB3 is going to shock you. Tennessee Titans quarterback Ryan Tannehill, all right? What? Yes. No. And yes. <laughs> Come on. Nine games last season, Jay, and his average finish in those nine games was QB9. He was overall QB21 in points because he only played nine games, and his current ADP is stupid at QB21. Oh, this well. Is a guy, these are, there's a couple of guys where if you're diligent and you wait to the very last pick in your draft and you go quarterback, this is one of those guys at the top of my list because his upside is immense. I mean, that's crazy. I was going to check you. I was going to tell you to go back and check your formula. That couldn't be true. But you know, you're painting a picture where you're, it makes some sense. I, I, I'm, I, I am shocked. I am shocked. You're right. And and uh, if all those numbers are true, then that price is ridiculous. Right. I mean, the Tennessee Titans, is, it's almost like once Ryan Tannehill entered the uh, formula there in Tennessee, they they became a, a real dominant offense, and it worked to their – I mean, Derrick Henry, I hope Derrick Henry bought Ryan Tannehill a really nice watch in this offseason for the money <laughs> he's making this year. Because I swear, when that man came to town and started playing – or when he got in the starting lot and started playing quarterback for the Tennessee Titans, like I said, that offense could score – 
its hand to the defense. I mean, they, they made it the AFC Championship game, I, and and that gave Derrick Henry the opportunity, as we're going to talk about, I'm sure, uh, a chance to feast in, in every game that Ryan Tannehill is starting at quarterback. So, oh yes, uh, we spoiler alert: Derrick Henry is on our running back list, and I definitely <laughs> delineated his performances after Ryan Tannehill came. To oh, the all right, I'm good foresight out of you. Steve. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> moving on to another potentially equally surprising quarterback on this list for you guys. Foresight consistency quarterback number two, Detroit Lions quarterback Matthew Stafford. What is going on? This guy missed uh, half the season due to injury. But in five of seven games played, this man finished as QB6 or better. He is currently going as QB13 in drafts, pretty much for free. And, I mean... This is one of the guys that I will be thrilled if I end up with, if I go absolutely zero QB until the very end. In five of seven games played, he was QB six or better. That is correct. I, I never, dude, if you would ask me to bet on that, well, I'm I bet, wish I wouldn't have told you. I'm <laughs> betting the house on the other side. I'm like, there's no way QB six or better. No, get out of here. That's, that's All pretty right. surprising. So I would say that, and I and I have to say I don't know what his like the health of his back injury, like how that's come along, what his actual health is, and all that stuff. Uh, so it's going to be something to keep an eye on. And the only reason I bring that up is in 2018 he did play the entire fantasy season and had a single QB one finish the entirety of the fantasy football season. Huh. But he was nursing a back injury, and we found out after the fact, because he was a big disappointment, that he had that back injury. And obviously it went on to hamper him and cause him to miss time this year. So he is, um, I, I guess I'm going to call him the curious case of Benjamin Button 2.0 because uh, out of this list because he's like – he, I could see him being an absolute steal at where he's going, or I could see him being somebody that, like, a couple of weeks in, because you drafted him low, you're like, hey, I'm on a cup bait. Like, he's he's toast. What's his ADP again? ADP is currently QB13, and I know you both will remember this from our preview podcast last season. I was calling for Matthew Stafford to have a big season last year because we had found out he was fighting through that back injury, right. because we had found found out the motivation he had off the field with what his wife was battling. Yeah. And until he went off the field with that back injury, that was totally playing out and coming, true for, coming to fruition. Kenny Galladay is just taking another step. Marvin Jones is healthy. TJ Hawkinson's taking another step. They now have some support in that backfield to slightly ouchy carry on Johnson. And, you know, I'm just saying, don't sleep on Matt Stafford. Everything comes down to that relative price tag. And right now, QB 13 is like going and getting a steak at the dollar store. Like, <laughs> this, man has, this man has league winning upside at that price point. And that's not, I'm not joking. Prime Matty Stafford. I like it. Right. Number one on the list is, you know, this is just like, just like the tight ends with Travis Kelsey. Just like the wide receivers with Michael Thomas, you all know who the number one foresight consistency quarterback was in 2019. That is none other than Baltimore Ravens quarterback Lamar Jackson. This man had 11 of 15 games played last year where he was top six. It's just stupid. He's currently going as ADP QB2, and that's a value. I, 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 can't, I, I don't know what it is. It pains me that he was QB1 overall last year and QB1 in consistency. Just because we were wrong about him. Let him go. <laughs> I will not. Okay. No. I can't take emotion out of it this time. Man, Lamar is no joke. No joke. Oh, he faces the Cleveland Browns. You know, I was going to say, for me personally, it's because he's <laughs> the AFC North and plays for the Baltimore Ravens. You know, <laughs> it's part that. It's part that he goes 8 for 10 and rushes for 100 yards. And I just don't see that as being a sustainable way to be a quarterback in this league long term. You know, I've heard that, Jay. And even if the man has some red zone uh, pass touchdown regression, 
it's very likely that he could make that up on the ground. Oh, I know, I with, know. So what rushing touch? He is a dual threat anywhere. But how His long? Accuracy has improved immensely. I mean, I know but you can't. You can't better. predict injury, but you can you can calculate risk. And is there a quarterback in this league who has more risk than he does because of how much he relies on his legs and how long can he continue to do so and and get away with it? I feel like he's always playing on borrowed time, and yes, he's lighting it up and it's fun and it's flashy, but can this last? I mean, you guys both make valid points and I think that that's what makes Lamar Jackson such an interesting fantasy football player is you know he's certainly a polarizing player there's a lot of people that you know myself included I, I'd rather shy away from the risk at the cost I mean he's QB2 in drafts he's going to be expensive but <laughs> I, I can certainly see the allure of wanting to have Lamar Jackson as your QB1 in your fantasy football. guys before we dive into running backs we should have, like, a judge show where Ben and I disagree and Steve's the judge and, like, he banks his gavel and he's like, guys, listen, I like you both. You're both right. I can see the value in both of your arguments. For me, it's not going to be like this. <laughs> He'd be, like, the most polite judge ever. Well, you know, we all have those jobs. And I'd, I'd foot the table and be like, come on, side with me. Say, that's, that's better than you deserve, so let's not <laughs> And Lamar rushed the ball 176 times last season. And, you know, th that was over the, the standard 16-game schedule, whereas fantasy is typically over 15 games. So how many, maybe how many touch less than that. You're still averaging about 10 per game. I was trying to look up, and I hopefully will, I will commit to this to our listeners, before the uh, preview podcast, I will do everything I can to try to figure out the number of times that man got hit last season, whether in the pocket, how many times he slid, because every time I remember watching, him, I know I remember he's elusive. At how well he was able to I, keep himself from taking those monsters. Right. So you're right. I'd be curious to see if the numbers back that up. Hey. But until he stops, until he stops protecting himself and being smart, do you I don't know how much injury risk there really is? Do you he's faster than everybody? <laughs> Do you have his numbers up right now? Uh, I do. What How do many know? pass attempts did he have? Twelve. <laughs> yeah, not many my boy, my man, uh, Steve. That is per <laughs> game. He had 401 pass attempts. Okay, all right, all right. That, but, I mean, but to be fair, the rank on that has got to be pretty low. He has 26 <laughs> in the league. Okay, so, you All know, right. but how many guys are capable of running the ball 176 times? So, you know, it's I don't know. I you know, I I'll be honest. My I am very analytics based in my assessment of rookies coming out of college. Okay, his accuracy was terrible. I mean, terrible. I never expected for him to come to the NFL in his accuracy. Oh no, I know by like I 10 know plus percent. You're right. So, that tells me that the, the kid is really talented and that they are coaching him up very well and scheming to his strengths very well in Baltimore, like they always unfortunately do over there. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't know. Like you said, Jay, unless something happens where he gets injured, I don't know that this kid's slowing down anytime soon. I'm going to send a message to the Foresight attorney and have him help me start preparing my case for the preview podcast because that's going to be a fun one to debate. <laughs> Nice. Speaking ding, of fun ding, ones, this next guy on our list as we transition to the running back position in this podcast is my favorite player that I studied in this podcast. I didn't expect that coming in. I had some preconceived notions that I have now done a complete 180 on Wow! based off of this research. I am talking about L.A. Chargers running back Austin Eckler. And I'll tell you why after your guys' reaction. But Austin Eckler finished as Forksight Consistency running back six. His overall fantasy points was running back four, which tells you that he was a little top-heavy in his performances and that RB4 is probably his, like, super ultimate ideal seal. However, his ADP at RB11 may actually be a value. And after I hear your guys' take, I'm going to tell you why. I, I, my initial response is I'm I'm surprised. I'm a, I'm a little surprised he was that high on consistency. 
And really, last year, I was very surprised in his total performance because in 2018, when Melvin Gordon went down with injury and he finally got his time to shine and be the man because he was such a dynamic scorer and he had an efficient fantasy score in his limited opportunities, he was a huge disappointment. And I know one of those games was in London, and those can be kind of different ball games, but he was a massive disappointment being the main guy. So last year... You know, I, I didn't know what to expect. I, I didn't want to invest that much in him because I wasn't sure he could really be that elite performer when he's the lead dog, but he really did a fantastic job in being the number six most consistent running back in the league is, is testament of that. So I think that if Philip Rivers was still a quarterback and nothing was changed except for Melvin Gordon was gone, like he is, that his ADP certainly would be higher. And I think there's there's just some trepidation there with how much Tyrod Taylor will rely on him, how much Justin Herbert, if he's in the lineup, he'd rely on him. Because I, I do believe that Austin Eckler set the all-time record for fantasy points scored from receiving statist- from a receiving statist- statistical standpoint by a running back which is insane because we've seen some insane seasons, like going back to Marshall Falk in the early 2000s, up through Christian McCaffrey in the last couple of years. So, you know, I think that I think that makes sense in a way. That's what his ADP is. And it's going to be really interesting. That's going to be a team I'm really interested in following throughout the offseason and trying to get a feel for what Eckler's role will be. And for all we know, it, he might be relied on heavily in the passing game anyways because he can certainly play out of the slot if he needs to. Yep, and as long as Tyrod Taylor's playing, that is, you want to talk about Mr. Checkdown. He, he is all about the short throws, number one. Number two, as of two weeks ago, an L.A. Chargers-focused website, boltbeat.com, predicted a 65 to 70 percent share of the backfield for Austin Eckler in 2020 whereas the other 30 to 35 percent is going to go to Justin Jackson here's why that's important Melvin Gordon did not come back until week five in the first four weeks without Melvin Gordon Austin Eckler's average snap percentage was 71 percent that correlated to an average fantasy finish of RB7. When Melvin Gordon came back, that average snap percentage dropped to 51%, and his average finish correlated with that as RB17. So if all you have to tell me, forget who's playing quarterback, that this guy is definitely going to get about 70% of the snaps, ADP RB11 is a very nice price tag for me all day long. It certainly seems like it's probably got a safe floor with some very strong upside at that spot. So, yeah, great great value for him if he stays there. Yeah, and I mean, uh, three out of the four weeks that Melvin Gordon was gone, he was RB4 or better. RB2, RB4, RB18, RB4. So that's we only have a four-game sample size without Melvo back there. I understand, Steve, like you said, you made a great point that he set a record from receiving. Tyrod Taylor's not going to be that far off and relying on him in the passing game, I don't believe. It'll be interesting to see. And I think Tyrod Taylor's going to be better than people think. And he's going to hold Justin Herbert off longer than people think, which is going to lend well to my confidence in Austin Eckler. But like everything in fantasy football, we shall see, and that's the beauty of this game. Next up is another really fun running back, another one that's probably going to surprise you, another one that I'm probably way higher on now than the rest of you heading into 2020. I am talking about the brand-new running back for the Atlanta Falcons, Todd Gurley. Wow. Todd Gurley only missed one fantasy-eligible game due to injury last season. He was foresight consistency running back five. He was RB14 overall in fantasy points. And guess what his current ADP is? RB19. I'll take that all day because, again, he only missed one game and he played 75% of the snaps. That's all shocking. I know. <laughs> I had no idea. You know, you know, you pretend you didn't hear that. That's all shocking. He really played 75% of the snaps last year? Yeah, man. 
And equally shocking is Atlanta did not draft a running back. They right. They brought anybody I, in. And I right know. Now, if they were to pull an old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard for a running back in free agency, the cupboard is looking pretty uh, Who's left? Right yeah, exactly. So, um, and you know they're only going to drop like flies throughout the offseason, right. especially an offseason like this one. So, right. You know, you just have to look at it like it, running back, do you say 19 currently? 19. ADP running back 19, and I think this COVID offseason benefits somebody like, like Todd Gurley, who's not going to be pushed as everybody. much. Could you not hear me, Steve? Okay, there. Sweet. I got you back. I, I didn't know what happened there. But, but yeah, I, absolutely. I ugh, Like, who's going to have the volume in that backfield? Right. Todd Gurley is also a, a proven pass catcher. And while Atlanta might not be a heavy ground game kind of an offense – they always produce, you know, whether it's by committee or one or two guys, they always produce, like, nice fantasy running back. So at that price tag, if Gurley, as long as he's healthy and suiting up for week one, give me that, and I'll ride that as long as I can. Next, and, he's, you know? oh, and he's a three-down back for them. He can catch Absolutely. out of the backfield. Yeah. yeah. And and for people that say he fades down the stretch, let me tell you, his last four weeks of the season last oh, year, boy. R- RB10, 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 RB16. He was fine. That's pretty consistent, too. Yeah, yeah, it it was. (laughs) Holy. It was. And now he's getting a much better offensive line. Unreal. much better quarterback. Unreal. They have much better wide receivers. Yeah. Opening my eyes. Opening my eyes. You keep them shut open. And he's going back home. Majority, yeah, so yeah. It, awesome. talking yeah, about motivation. A little bit extra. Yep. Yeah, it, it, it definitely does. Yep. yep. So moving on to foresight consistency, running back four. We already mentioned him a little bit ago on this podcast. You're talking about Tennessee Titans running back Derrick Henry. And he finished as RB7 overall in fantasy points. So his consistency is was actually better than his fantasy finish, and he usually gets accused of being super boomer bust. And his current ADP is right in line with his foresight consistency at RB4. And I alluded to you guys before that I delineated between his before and after once Ryan Tannehill took over. Once Ryan Tannehill took over, his average finish was 12.75. So, I mean... There, there was only two times in that stretch that he killed you. Otherwise, he finishes RB8, RB4, RB1, RB3, RB4, and RB7. There's not a lot of fluke in those numbers. What were the down weeks, out of curiosity? They were bad. Okay. 39 and 36. They were bad. They, they hurt you. Yeah. Uh, but they're... You know, that's a pretty good ratio. 75% of the time, you're getting a top eight or better running back with Brian Tannehill under center. Uh, yeah, and I'd take that all day. Right. And what's his price What's his price point again? Price point is right in line with his foresight consistency rank, both RB4. Interesting. Okay. And I think we, we all probably agree, you know, when it does come to playing, you know, PPR – versus standard you know we're talking ppr and you do have a derrick henry it it is it is massive that we saw what he could do given the opportunity the opportunity coming when he has competent quarterback play and a competent offense which gives that defense a chance to you know it just helped them build leads and they could feed him the ball and he could wear defenses down and that is what we all, all kind of envision the running back he would be in the nfl and he certainly showed it um i mean he only had two rb1 performances the prior year and he had like i think nine was it nine last year um so nine or eight e- either yeah, yeah, way he had, uh, he had, a, he a had massive eight jump. in the first 16 weeks yeah not yeah, counting um, week 17. A, a massive jump. So, and and then on the flip side, when he's not having an RB one performance, it, it usually is one that's going to hit your fantasy team pretty hard. But if you're going to tell me half the time a guy's going to give you an RB one or better performance throughout the year, I mean, you're going to eat that up. No, you know, no matter who it is. Well, and and he, he had a couple of down weeks, and he's the fourth most consistent running back in the league, which just and, goes and, to show you that everybody else has him too and has more. Right, and one of the things that Steve's co- that Steve covers in his blog about our new foresight consistency metric is that it it gives us the ability to quantify players who got better and better down the stretch, which that qualifies 
for Derrick Henry in a big way because the first half of the season was Marcus Mariota, second half of the season was Ryan Tannehill, and he balled out under Ryan Tannehill. It's, you said that he should go and get a nice gift for Ryan Tannehill. What, what should he be doing to Marcus Mariota? Is he the reason that he's been so up and down over the years? <laughs> Does he have some beef with Mr. Mariota? I think he might. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right, they live, they live far away from each other now, so that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. All right, moving on. Last three is not going to surprise anybody. Pretty chalk, but three studs to round out this episode. Number three is Jay's favorite running back of all time. Foresight consistency, running back three, New York Giants, former Penn State running back, Saquon Barkley. Uh, he did miss a couple of games due to injury. Uh, he played... 12 of 15 fantasy eligible games. He finished his RB12 overall due to that missed time. But again, still, when he was on the field, a top three running back in foresight consistency. No surprise, his current ADP is running back two. Uh, and, and, you know, it's right in line with where he finished up consistency wise. Yep, he's great. Whatever. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he comes from such a phenomenal Big Ten school that's so much better than Ohio just State. a just a great <laughs> institution of learning. <laughs> yes, and, uh, yeah, and <laughs> I was gonna say, who's <laughs> making the comment? Who's making the comment? <laughs> yeah, as soon as I said that, I was like, I have to go take a shower. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, Be I, careful. I just love how much Jay hated on Saquon before he came in the league. It's just hilarious. Well, hey, he didn't do anything in Ohio Stadium, so. You know, I you know you made sound arguments, and it was really fun to listen to you go off on him. And it was even more <laughs> fun to listen. You have to admit that you were wrong. <laughs> yep, completely wrong. Right. Moving on. Who's number two? Moving on to number two. I don't. Is it just me, or does it seem like every time I turn around, people are for some reason down on this guy heading into twenty twenty? I mean, I, I don't know if that's just me and I've just heard a select pattern of, of wrong information, but I feel like people are sleeping on Zeke Elliott heading into 2020. Uh, he was foresight consistency running back two in 2019. And I think because of his lack of overall dominant super upside weeks, have given people the misperception that Zeke has fallen off. Well, I mean... <sighs> He, he was still RB5 overall. He's going as RB3 in ADP right now, and he's foresight consistency running back two. That tells me that even at RB3, you're getting a good value. I mean, listen, obviously he's an, an elite running back. All the numbers say that. I don't know if it's – I think partially it was team coaching because the last two seasons, Dallas struggled for the first parts of the season – Everybody, not just fantasy land, football fans, everybody are like, feed Zeke, what are you doing? Like, feed your feed the rock to the guy, your most talented player, and let's go take over games. And then late in the season, you finally see the Cowboys do that, and he starts to produce. So I feel like he's probably had some more disappointing games, even though they've probably been, you know, high-end fantasy returns, but I, I think they're just not as high as you would expect out I'm of sorry, Zeke. Steve, I got to jump in here real quick because I, I, I've i heard a lot of chatter that second to only uh, some guy named Freddie Kitchens, uh, supposedly the biggest clown show at the coaching side of things was the Dallas Cowboys. Well, I mean, come so, on. I, if 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 like my Cleveland Browns, all of a sudden you have a big mess of dysfunction that's removed from the equation, and you have a quarter or a coach in Mike McCarthy that is now extremely willing to feed you the ball, let alone give you goal line opportunities, uh, then I think Zeke is going to thrive in this new offense. And I, you know, I it, it, the the ADP is not lining up with some of the sentiments that I feel like I've heard lately, but uh, you know he. I still think even at RB3, you're getting a very nice value on C. Kevin. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think some of his slow start last season, whether anyone wants to admit it or not, or he would never want to admit it, is you do miss all that time in training camp. I don't care how hard you're training in Cabo. You're not there at the team. You're not doing team drills. You're not doing what you need to do to get football ready. And he, maybe he would have been ready to take on a massive workload early on, but I feel like the Cowboys, with what they invested in him, they kind of 
you know, eased him along Zeke style into the offense last year. And, and to both your guys' points, there were certainly some inexplicable play calling at times. I mean, myself being someone who'd watch those games and follow him closely, you'd be like, okay, it's first and two. He just ripped off a nine yarder to put you down there. And we're going to throw the ball two times in a row, three times in a row, try to, you know, it's almost like uh, yeah. trying to pad stats for a different guy on the offense. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, you, I think the coaching staff's definitely going to help his cause this season, for sure. We, we've we talked about some elite players tonight, guys, and who have either switched teams or are in different situations, and, and we're, we've, dis, we've discussed what we expect in 2020. And for me, there's some hesitancy with various guys. Of all the players we've discussed that are kind of in that situation with coaching changes, new teams, or what have you, I feel the best about Zeke being able to be at that elite level. I feel like they're all, they all have elite ability, but I, I just feel like if he gets the carries like we expect he should, he should once again be a top three running back in the league. Yeah, I totally agree. And I was just looking up a stat to support my argument for our last and final guy. Uh, <laughs> none other than the cornerstone of our league of record, my keeper, talent none other than running back cmc christian mccaffrey from the carolina panthers you thought michael thomas's consistency season was impressive from the wide receiver position well christian mccaffrey said hold my beer michael <laughs> thomas like we said had 11 of 15 games where he was top six christian mccaffrey decided to one up him and go 12 out of 15 top six finishes at the running back position and just one finish all season outside the top 15. And the stat that I was looking up was where Teddy Bridgewater ranked in yards per attempt or yards per completion. I can't tell based on the metric I'm looking at right now, but regardless, he was QB 21. He's another gent that likes to check down. They just paid Christian McCaffrey a whole lot of money over there. I don't care about the coaching change. That dude is going to keep eating and bawling and feasting. And, uh, you know, Mr. Checkdown Teddy Bridgewater just lends to that success in my opinion. Steve, you know, you're going to have to be the judge once again, and I have a feeling I know whose side you're going to be uh, falling on, but I just don't know how you can have yeah, that nice type of volume for so long and be able to stay healthy and on the field. It just it seems... Christian McCaffrey before... It just seems like at some point we're going to have an ACL or something better like hope. that. You better hope. <laughs> yeah, so. Maybe uh, two. Just, I don't know. And, and uh, no, I, so to Ben's point, yeah, I, I certainly can see where, you know, he. I don't think he's going to have as high a volume, but he outscored the RB2 by so much in fantasy football well, that he, he can come down quite a bit, still being in the RB1 conversation. However, there is something to be said, you know, historically over time, registering the kind of workload he did have with over 400 touches last season. You know, how will he hold up? That doesn't necessarily mean he'll have a catastrophic injury, but, you know, he might he might wear down a little bit. Maybe, maybe that happens where he doesn't miss any games, where he just he does have to take a little bit of a – a, a tapered back workload as the season goes on. It, it's going to be very fascinating to watch because you guys both know I love Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. I mean, I think he's a phenomenal football player, great human being, someone you really want to root for in the NFL. So, you know, I I, I can't wait to watch him next season. Dude's electric. Steve, wasn't it in one of your blog entries? It's been a couple of months, and, you know, frankly, I forget my name sometimes, but well, didn't we do a regression study and we, we and we did, and I've got some numbers. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. He did a phenomenal. Here phenomenal comes the rebuttal. He <laughs> did a phenomenal blog study talking about the average regression of guys that have the amount of volume and the amount of production that Chris yeah. McCaffrey had. All right. So if I took the average regression compared to what CMC did last season, and then took the adjusted point total and ranked him among where the rest of the running backs finished. So 
you, what you can't know in regression is how much is going to be regressed. Uh, you just know a total touch regression. You don't know how much is going to regress from the rushing attempt side versus the pass. Balls. Sure. Right. Right. So I, I had to do this in a couple of, of, uh, of multiple scenarios. So if if all of his ideally the best case scenario in PPR is that all of his reduced touches were just rushing attempts and his passing volume remained intact. Sure. If that were the case, based on the historic reg regression of guys with that volume of reduction, his, he still would have finished his RB1 overall. <laughs> and instead of the number one fantasy score in all of fantasy football, he would have been number four. Okay. So now that is best case scenario. I think a much more likely scenario is if the, if the, the regression was somewhere 50-50 or, or a little more 75-25 on the rushing side. So at 75% rushing regression versus pass regression, you're still getting RB3 numbers and top 10 overall fantasy scoring. Okay. So even if he experiences that average regression, to your guys' point, as long as he can stay healthy, I still like the man with a, a top five floor. But that was one of, one of the biggest things I took away from that entire study, though, was out of in the last 20 years i believe it was 18 different instances where you know running backs had registered 400 touches but over half the time the drop off you know in total yardage was a, like a thousand yards or more it might have been 900 or more but it was substantial but of course so looking at like the overall average regression you know that's a, certainly one angle to look at it but uh i took I away mean, I, from i did was, the average regression including yards 790 it would have been a combination of an average of 117 less touches 790 less yards 7.3 total tds that i mean i took all that away from him and he's still getting he had that good of a season last year so you know i understand what you're saying but i just feel like he's so young and he is he registered the best NFL combine in NFL history. I think this he's just a different cat. He's a different breed. And I am, at least for this season, I'm not concerned about it. Ben's all in. All in. <laughs> As evidenced by my actions. <laughs> away everything for CMC. So last year, Steve, me and you butted heads on Derrick Henry, and I was right. This year, maybe we'll buy heads on CMC and you'll be right. As always, it's going to be super fun to find out. And once again, this was another great episode. And I can't wait to come back next week. We're going to order the players. Now we're going to get back to just focusing on one position at a time. And next week, I'm going to rank, I don't know how many, at least 12 quarterbacks where we're going to start in order of their overall fantasy points finish and compare the rest of their metrics to see how real or not real that finish actually was. Nice. And you can hopefully apply that to your 2020 season. And, uh, man, once we get through the quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, and tight end of the What We Learn series, it's preview time as long as everything is still on track. So we've got some exciting times ahead. Either of you guys got anything else before we get out of here tonight? Thanks, everybody, for watching. If you would, if Go out, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us wherever you can, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you guys learned something, had some fun, and hopefully we're entertaining for you. Thanks for tuning in. Good thanks, know. everyone. Not just thanks, everyone, and I had a great time. Love it. Yeah, always, always love uh, you know taking an hour or so out of our day and getting together <laughs> talking fantasy football, and uh, you know it, it's fun to bust on each other back and forth. And there's no two people I'd rather do this with. So. We will catch everybody next time for our What what We Learned in 2019 series. Can't wait. And that wraps up this episode of Fantasy Foresight, the podcast. We thank you for joining us. Be sure to visit us, as always, at FantasyForesight.com. Use the links at the bottom of the page to find us across social media, including Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and wherever you pod. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and we'll see you next time.